us today, and our topic was twins, um, and our faculty advisor is Dr. Briette. So I'm going to start with the case presentation. Um, Ms. J.F. presented to the labor unit for the first time on the 25th of August, and she was complaining of abdominal pain um, with a term of hearing abdomen. She had not had any prenatal care. Um, her cervix at the time was 1 to 250 and minus 3. Cervical length was found to be 2.1. We did an ultrasound, and uh, upon the ultrasound, we found that she had two babies present. So she had a twin um, pregnancy, and we uh, did the scan and showed her to be at 30 and 30 weeks one day. Uh, vertex, vertex, and at the time, the chorionicity was unclear of whether it was monodi versus didi. Um, so, a little background, patient, medical history, asthma, questionable chronic hypertension, she wasn't seen before 20 uh, weeks, and then a carrier of leash 9 syndrome. Um, she had a history of two DNCs with, uh, with SABs. Um, she was a G10 uh, with five uncomplicated vaginal deliveries and uh, infant, two infants with leash 9 syndrome. GYN, positive history of chlamydia. She had a history of an abnormal pap smear with normal follow up. Um, she was a uh, 10 plus year smoker, allergies to iodine. So at the time, her um, NST for both twins were reactive. She had no cervical change. Um, so she was discharged home to follow up in the clinic in the perinatal center. So then she was seen five days later and um, had an ultrasound in the perinatal center showing dye twins. And here you can see the land design in this ultrasound image for her. Um, and also in this one, you can see the placenta up in the right corner for the twin B and the other placenta for twin A down in the left corner. Um, at this time, she was, the twins were shown to have inner twin discordance of 7.6%. Um, Corpedal growth, AC, was less than 5%. Um, twin A had hydronephrosis of the left kidney, and then um, the right the right kidney had mild hyalectasis. Um, and then our twin B had mildly dilated bilateral kidneys. So she came into the labor unit again, um, and she had a abdominal pain. At that time, her cervix was 450 and high. Um, she was kept for observation for 72 hours. She was given ACS for lung maturity, um, penicillin as GBS prophylaxis, and Procardia as needed for tocolysis. After that, she had no cervical change, so she was sent home with strict precautions. Um, she had come into labor unit a couple other times um, to rule out Admitted on the 13th of October at 37 weeks for spontaneous rupture of membrane. She came in plenty of loss of fluid. Um, she did have a primary LTH with no complications. Um, twin A was 5 pounds 7 ounces with FR7 and 9. Twin B 4 pounds 11 ounces FR7 and 9. Um, immediate postpartum of course was uncomplicated. She was discharged home two days later and um, her post-op course was complicated by wound infection but we won't into that. So uh, multiple gestation, the biology of twinning. So the incidence of twinning is increasing as the population ages and also with the increased um, modalities of assisted reproductive technology. So statistics for incidence of twinning is derived from national and regional birth records. Um, it doesn't include occurrence of twins at conception because of prenatal mortality and abortion um, or fetus uh, um, so 1.05% to 1.35% of pregnancies were twins in 1935, and recent national statistics show 3.3% of 4 million births in the U.S. were multiples or 1 in 30 gestations. Um, Dizygotic twinning, twinning rate varies under different circumstances. Uh, Monozygotic is constant, usually between 3.5 to 4. Um, in 1,000 pregnancies. And currently, at least one in 43 births is a twin, and one in uh, 1,341 pregnancies is triplets, or results in triplets. 
Um, the DZ to MZ ratio has uh, declined from 1.12 to 0.05 from 1960 to 1970. This is um, likely due to adverse environmental factors as a possible cause. Types of twins, there's monozygotic. These are what we know as like identical. Um, so approximately one third of the twins in the US are monozygotic. And you assess this by the uh, Weinberg differential me method which basically is like sex pairs minus unlike sex pairs divided by the number of pregnancies is, how the, is the formula. Um, and they have a, there's a relatively uniform incidence across uh, different populations for monozygotic and um, it's shown to rise only slightly with advancing maternal age. Um, if for dizygotic, the rate increases with maternal age, so that's in comparison to monozygotic, dizygotic um, rate does show to increase the maternal age to 35 years, and then it abruptly decreases or drops. Um, the rate also increases with parity, uh, higher conceptions within the first three months of marriage. Um, it de decreases during periods of malnutrition. Uh, there's genetic factors that play a role and these occur in certain families. Um, and it also increases with poil frequency. So there was a case where there was a sperm of two fathers, one white male twin and one um, African American twin were born of the same mom and uh, there was coitus at one week apart. Causes of twinning. Uh, Dizygotic is double ovulation. Um, hormonal induction, ovulation leading to multiple pregnancy. Um, they're shown to be higher serum gonadotropin, or uh, associated with higher serum gonadotropin levels, influenced by maternal age, nutrition, parity, maternal genotype. Um, there has also been association with mutation on chromosome three, which codes for receptor gene. There's a questionable relationship to fragile X. Um, Insulin-like growth factor one interacts with ovulation and folliculogenesis. So this has also been implicated. And uh, it, in light of this, these may be correct, but they are not like strictly scientifically proven as causes. Um, and then for monozygosity, there's increase in use of ovulation-enhancing uh, agents like seen in our, uh, it occurs more frequently with advancing maternal age. And uh, the hypothesis, there's a hypothesis that exists that MZ twins result from um, teratologic uh, ter event. Um, there's chromosomal markers for diagnosis as well, and uh, an analysis of restriction fragment link polymorphism, or RFLP used, used um, by testing the blood or the placental tissue as well. So this um, it, diagram basically shows, and I apologize because the blue background kind of uh, takes out the outline of the y, x and y axis, but basically it's showing uh, the timeline of when uh, splits happen in twinning in comparison with um, the temporal relationship with embryo, embryologic changes. Placentation and twinning, so there's monochorionic, um, this is always the same sex. They're all are monozygotic, monozygotic um, except for rare, rare exceptions. And uh, monoamniotic twins are monochorionic and <coughs> occur at least uh, occur least commonly, approximately an instance of one percent. Um, so, placentation, uh, dichorionic. So placentation continued dichorionic. Uh, MZ twins, if they're separated during the first two days, which you could see on that diagram um, a couple slides back, after fertilization or membranes fused, so this accounts for 20 to 30 percent of MZ twins. And then DZ twins, they always have a dichorionic placentation. Um, the blood vessels don't cross from one side to, uh, to another, and if you dissect the dividing membranes, it'll show four layers. Um, one amnion on each side, and then two chorions in the middle. Uh, there's also there's irregular chorionic fusion, which is uh, just differential expansion of the fetal sacs, where the membranes of one placenta kind of pushes away the membranes of the other. And then, um, as far as triplets, quadruplets, high order, higher order multiples, um, you may have coexisting monochorionic and dichorionic 
placentation. Mortality rates in twinning for monoamniotic twins, um, the, this type of twin is less common. Mortality rate is approximately 50 to 60 percent. Um, the cords are frequently encircled and knotty, and then this leads to chronic <coughs> stasis and then stillbirth or thrombosis and fetal vessel calcification. Um, so fetal demise is common in the first part of pregnancy, and then after 32 <coughs> weeks, there's no further mortality from this cord um, entangling. So diamniotic monochorionic twins, they're the next highest perinatal mortality uh, rate, approximately 25%. And there's a high frequency of interfetal uh, twin trans twin twin transfusion sy syndrome, um, and then finally, dichorionic twins have the lowest mortality rate at approximately 8.9 percent. So, a quick blurb on velamentous insertion of umbilical cord invasive previous. Velamentous insertion is 69 times higher incidence in twin placentas. Um, and it's even higher in higher order uh, multiples. And then for basal previa, it's important. It's very serious, it can be lethal um, because of exsanguination during delivery, especially um, if the if the basal previa exists over the os or over the dividing membrane and the second, the first twin delivered and the second twin's cord has a velamentous insert, insertion. This can lead to uh, fetal hemorrhage, which leads to death and has been has led to death within three minutes observing the die-die twin uh, membranes of a second twin were ruptured. So monoamniotic twins are all monozygotic. Um, they all have a single chorion. This is the least common type, which I mentioned. Uh, one in 33 to one in 661 twin births are of this, uh, have a single chorion. So, for our monoamniotic. Most uh, common complication is encircling or nodding the cords with cessation of umbilical uh, blood flow. Preterm delivery at 32 to 34 weeks has increased survival in these uh, twins, and most mono twins have interfetal placental anastomoses. High mortality rate, um, so that's why it's very important for an antepartum diagnosis. And with with that inadequate prenatal care, um, have about 90% survival rate. In both cohorts, rise near each other on the placenta and. Um, Rarely, they can be partially fused or velamentous. So, fusion of cords represents the transition to the monoamniotic conjoined twins, which we'll touch on later. Um, di diamniotic monochorionic twins. This is the most common type of uh, type observed in MZ twins. Sorry, which is approximately seventy percent. The placenta is usually fused. Uh, umbilical cords have a marginal or, ve or velamentous insertion. And so the diagnosis is very, very apparent from the absence of the ridge at the base of the dividing membranes and the translucency of dividing membranes. So when you di dissect these membranes, there's one amnion um, stripped and it reveals a single chorion plate with the fetal blood vessels. And it's always, almost always possesses interfetal blood vessel communications. And acidosis are uh, more common to be artery to artery then vein to vein, but sometimes both types are present. Um, and then large anastomoses can lead to exsanguination of second twin, I mentioned earlier with phase of previa, or um, delayed cord clamping after delivery. And here are a couple images. You can see um, a diamniotic monochorionic twin placenta with anastomoses up in the left top left corner. Um, you can see Dymo twins here down on the left and die die comparison um, right next to it. And then uh, this is the far right example um, was I believe one of the cases um, where the one um, I'll just skip that. Okay. Conjoined twins. Monozygotic twins with incomplete embryonic division at 13 to 15 days. This also you could see um, very nicely in that original di the schematic diagram. Um, falling, so 13 to 15 days following conception. Frequency of 1.5 per 100,000 births. Um, ultrasound features that you see are a bifid fetal pole 
um, greater than three umbilical vessels and heads persistently at the same level and body plane and failure to change position relative to one another. So overall survival rate of conjoined twins, um, it's 8.3%. Classification, so basically these are just different classifications of, of conjoined twins. Um, I won't go into all of them, just the thracopagus is the most common type, or makes up 75% of them and um, they have a common sternum diaphragm, upper abdominal wall, liver, pericardium, and GI tract. Pass the mic to Dr. Weiss. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about morbidity, mortality with twins, a little bit about antenatal testing, antenatal diagnosis, uh, also delivery, planning for delivery, time for delivery. This is obviously not exhaustive. This is just kind of a quick run through here. So the glaringly obvious risk here is prematurity. Okay, about half the twin pregnancies, give or take 50%, um, born prematurely. Okay, now that's in comparison to 12% of singletons, and this is in a higher order talk, but about 75% of triplets. Um, if you look here, so 32 weeks uh, is what Creasy calls very early um, and this is where you see a lot of burden to health care obviously uh, a lot of morbidity in these babies um, a lot of a lot of money a lot of time spent taking care of them so something of, of, uh, of interest um, the mortality rate so you see here about five per thousand live births for twins that's in comparison to about 1.6 per thousand live births for uh, excuse me for singletons uh, and there's note at the bottom here, the same same-sex twins have a little higher rate. That's kind of uh, just looking more a little modifying ethnicity. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, twins uh, at risk for being smaller. You see some risk factors there: African American younger mothers, uh, male male pairs, uh, ten times the risk of a singleton. Okay. Um, so twins are responsible for 3% of all live births in the United States, but they're responsible for 25% of very low birth weight infants. That's the 1,500 grams that we talked about. And if you look at that chart, um, you see that, you know, the incidence of severe handicap amongst, amongst twins. Now, this isn't really a great comparison because if you adjust for gestational age and you look at comparisons in gestational age, there's no difference between singletons and, uh, and, and twins or very little, not statistically significant anyway. Um, so, so looking at mom here, so the incidence of maternal death, that's uncertain just because the, the sample size is so small there. Um, of course, again, preterm labor, the, the biggest, like I said, the glaringly obvious one here, but we see all these things very commonly, just a little more so common uh, in, in twins. I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see them. Uh, so this is just kind of a list of things that are different. The particular one here, you know, we see a, a, a very large increase, about a 20% increase in cardiac output uh, over singletons here. Uh, the plasma volume is increased, you know, generally 50% in singletons. We can see up to 100% plasma volume, so double plasma volume in, uh, in twin pregnancies. And, and this list here is it, pretty common sense if you, if you read them, uh, but these are changes uh, in multiple deaths compared to singleton gestations. Um, Role of ultrasound. Uh, this is also kind of self-explanatory here. Uh, this is what you do with an ultrasound, and that's what you do with an ultrasound with twins too. Um, so, confirmed diagnosis again, pretty self-explanatory. And here you can see uh, an example of die 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 on the left and a monochronic pregnancy here on the right. Um, and these are kind of the timeline. So, very valuable to have those diagnosis early. Um, and again, we're just kind of talking here. Uh, you see some some die die at the top and likely a monochorionic pregnancy there uh, at the bottom. Uh, this is so you know we're, we're looking at membrane here obviously and, and, and you know we talk about the lambda sign and dichorionic pregnancies. We talk about the T sign and monochorionic pregnancies or and and you know the the primer there greater two millimeters we call it a, a die chorionic pregnancy. And this is talking about amniocity. So, again, self-explanatory: two fetal poles, two yolk sacs, uh, diamniotic. Again, two fetal poles, one yolk sac, monoamniotic. Now, the specificity 
for this with ultrasound is, is, is not 100% certainly. Um, and so there's some certainly to keep in mind. Uh, fuel growth, obviously uh, we're very, very concerned certainly for, you know, concordance and twins. Uh, and so, you know, very reasonable to assess fuel growth serially, uh, Q3 to four weeks, two or three weeks. Um, and then looking at growth curves in general, uh, twins will stay pretty much, or should, can, should stay pretty much on par with singleton until about 30 weeks. Um, you see a lagging AC. Um, so the spree, I'm guessing is how you say this trial, this is a trial about 1,100, so a fair amount, uh, fair amount of patients here. And so they noticed uh, morbidity increase at an 18% growth discordance. Now we, we typically use 20% uh, kind of as our, our number. Um, and you can just see here that if we do have 20%, uh, we look at, you know, follow some very, very stringent serial growth and everything here. So cervical length, in, in essence, what this slide basically says is it has very little utility. Um, you know, even if we, if we do find a, a short cervical length, what, you know, what, what are we going to do about it? Because we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's, it's has very low, low utility in, in twin gestation. Um, Talking about kind of our testing here, BPP, Dopplers, amniotic fluid, uh, you know, same indications um, as a singleton as compared to uh, as compared to a multiple. Um, no, no, re no reason really to test these twins more early and often unless we have an indication uh, similar to a singleton gestation. Um, so, talking about kind of some antenatal testing, antenatal diagnosis here. This slide just kind of notes that uh, this is a, this is kind of a high point for counseling for patients. Okay, um, 31 year old will have at least one fetus with Down syndrome, equal to a 35 year old in a singleton pregnancy. So this just a kind of a, a timing age issue with a patient talking to them about you know what this test means, what its implications are, and things of that nature. Uh, and then triplets there again. You know, this is technically not a high order talk. Um, Again, so first uh, first trimester screening, we, we kind of know about this as far as from a singleton standpoint. Um, now, you know, we don't, we have data about twins, but there's not anything there to really make a great uh, statistically significant statement to say, you know, we absolutely need to do this. We have really, you know, so many numbers to support it. That's not completely there for twins. Um, so again, we rely heavily on ultrasound findings, uh, nuchal translucency, a uh, big one, and, and uh, Dr. Ghani is going to talk to us a little more about twin to twin transfusion, so certainly don't want to steal her thunder. Again, second trimester screening, kind of broad screen here. Um, certainly data, certainly a lot of data, um, but nothing near the significance of a singleton. Nothing to, uh, you know, Creasy says, sure, we can use it, uh, but the data is not fantastic, uh, not nearly as good. Um, again, ultrasound is, is the way to go. Um, amniocentesis certainly can be used as an antenatal, diagnose, uh, antenatal, antenatal diagnostic test, excuse me, uh, and the way in which it's performed, uh, pretty interesting, pretty common sense. Um, uh, you cannot use methylene blue, but what you do is you go in, pull off some, pull off some fluid, then you inject blue dye and indigo dye. Uh, and then when you go to resample, if your dye is blue, obviously you're in the same spot. You're going to get the same thing, so uh, you, need to, you need to kind of manipulate there. Um, again, um, certainly risk to amniocentesis, and uh, you need to be careful. Counsel your patients on all their risk of uh, preterm labor demise and things of that nature. Uh, Coronary villa sampling, again, uh, safety data is relatively limited. Um, but again, you need to, to map out where you're going, know what you're doing. Um, okay. uh, so preterm labor delivery, this is kind of things that we would typically do to prevent it. And, and in short, none of them work well uh, for twins. In fact, cerclage uh, can actually make your, your condition worse in twins, uh, up to a two-fold increased risk of uh, preterm labor and delivery. Um, and again, FFN in twins, 
negative predictive value is kind of the same story um, in singletons. Um, uh, this is just kind of the basic thing. When you're counseling your patients prenatally, they're going to need a little more, a little more vitamins, uh, one milligram of folic acid, a little more iron, uh, about more than twice as much. Um, again, we kind of talked about this field testing, surveillance, um, discordance. Uh, it's kind of the only one that really differs from a singleton. Uh, IUGR, oligo, maternal indications are the kind of things that we test for now, of course. Um, so, talking about timing of delivery. So, looking at, at, at diaclonic gestations, uh, the nadir for any perinatal mortality is 38 weeks, the nadir for composite mortality morbidity is around 37 weeks, um, and then talking about stillbirth, you see here, 39 weeks. Uh, multiple surpass that of singletons at 42 weeks. So delivery um, per the ACOG recommendations, 38 and 0 to 38 and 6 and dicronionic pregnancy that is uncomplicated, okay? It's all things being equal. Um, monocryonic gestations, again, uh, about 32 weeks, we see a 5% chance of uh, sudden death. Delivery recommended 34 to 30 weeks. Again, this is if everything is going perfectly well um, and there's no more, uh, and there's no additional risk factors. Um, triple gestation again, this is, I'm sorry, this is not how we're talk, but that's there. Um, okay, so n nothing to support VBAC in twins. This is a, a registry saying there's a 65% success rate, uh, but no, no really great data saying, yes, it's absolutely safe, we should do it. No great study saying that. Um, something that seems common sense, but you know, you have to stay ahead of the game here times two. So this can become a big staffing issue. As, from, especially from a neonatal standpoint, uh, you're going to have two babies, not one, obviously, and it's probably going to be preterm, and it's going to require a lot of attention. So, you know, this needs to be done as much of a controlled setting as possible, a planned setting. And like I said, that seems common sense, but but we can get lost in the mix, and so make sure that that happens. Uh, epidural certainly, uh, we need to be very cognizant of position um, throughout delivery, presentation throughout delivery. And we should deliver these patients in the OR just in case of need for emergency, uh, emergency C-section for twin B or twin A for that matter and have all appropriate staffing. Uh, vertex, vertex presentation happens in about 40, 45%. Um, again, we should deliver these people vaginally if there's no indication to, to not do so. Now we do need to make sure we have the appropriate staff and make sure we have the uh, appropriate experience in doing this. An ultrasound needs to be nearby. Uh, again, we're doing this in the OR. Um, and then we always want to be kind of actively managing twin B. We, we deliver twin A and we don't want to mess around and get twin B out. Uh, we can see, you see there, um, drawing some uh, umbilical artery pH. Uh, that, that pH of less than, um, less than seven increases as our interval to delivery increases there, as does C-section rate. So vertex, non-vertex twin is about 35 to 40%. Um, so obviously twin A's vertex, we deliver it, twin B, what do we want to want to think about? And these are the different things here. Um, certainly positions, discordance, you know, how big is this baby? Um, and also, you know, our experience, do you have staff experience in doing breach deliveries? Because that is, is a possibility, obviously. Um, and they talk about external savage version, uh, just a little bit about breach delivery here. Um, and, you know, down at the bottom. So they're saying 1,500 grams or greater, no benefit to C-section or breach delivery. That's pending you have the staff and you have the experience to do a breach delivery. Um, and again, we want to get that baby out active management. Uh, we're not going to sit on it and mess around. So uh, non-vertex, first 20, 15, 20%. C-section is the way to go. Now there's no absolute data to say that, but I mean, that's likely because nobody's going to try it any other way. So. Um, and higher order multiples. I know again, that's out of the scope, but C-section is recommended. Um, asynchronous delivery, this is delayed delivery of twin B. Obviously, this is acceptable only in the case of uh, extreme prematurity, paraviability, um, where you're gonna kind of wait for twin B and, and, and hold off. Um, again, this is a 50% 50 cent, 50 survival rate of the second twin. It's only looking at a couple studies. Um, but, uh, and then again, this, these studies did different things. We gave antibiotics, topolytics, uh, clamp the cord near the placenta. But with these studies and the numbers they gave, there's no there's no great data on how to manage this as far as giving you a, a, a definite. So that's all for me. So, 
So I'm going to talk about the different complications that you could have in monodye twins. Um, the first, and probably the one that we know the best, is twin-twin transfusion syndrome. And that's basically where there's a vascular communication in the placenta um, where blood from one baby goes to the other. Um, and it basically happens when they are both fed by the same cotyledon and you have an artery from one twin going to the vein for the other twin. So this is just a picture showing, um, basically what I just explained. So you have the donor um, arteries going and then it's shunting blood to the recipient. Um, so what tends to happen if this, ten if this keeps progressing is that the donor twin becomes hypoperfused, so it doesn't have enough blood, it develops IUGR and oligohydramnios, and you get a stuck twin appearance. So these are all graphical images of basically the membrane sitting right on top of the twin, and then the larger twin in one of the pictures. Um, so in these twins, you have the donor twin, it tends to have a lower hematocrit, but doesn't necessarily have any specific um, findings on fetal echo, whereas the recipient twin is hyperperfused, hyper becomes hypertensive, um, tends to produce, because it's fluid overloaded, atrial and uh, brain, A and P and B and P, so it can handle larger, volu uh, larger blood volume. So the baby tends to develop ventricular hypertrophy, becomes dilated, and can eventually go into cardiac failure. Um, and you'll also see that that baby has significant